Hello, engineers. So today's lesson is on what a robot needs in order to be a robot. So we have that broken down here into five essential features. First is senses. So a robot needs to be able to detect whatever is around it so that it can react appropriately. Then we have movement. So a robot needs to be able to move to the uh, job that it's doing, um, or it needs to be able to bring something towards it. Then we have energy. So a robot is going to need to have power in order to operate itself. And that can usually be electrical power, um, but sometimes there's other sources. Then there's intelligence. Um, so a robot is kind of like a tool that can use itself or operate itself. Um, so without intelligence, it's not going to be able to control itself. So most robots are going to have some kind of a computer that runs a program and that tells it what to do. Now, last, we have the output. Um, and this one is going to be different uh, based on every single robot. Um, this is the tools that the robot needs for its specific task. So if you had a robot that drilled holes, uh, the output would be like the drill that it's using. So let's take a look at the specifics here, and we're going to be starting with sensing. So robots can have all of the same senses that people can have. Um, so we're actually going to look at this in those terms. And here, um, if you see text that's in red, that's because that's kind of the main idea on this page. If you do have a notebook, it would be a good idea to write those down. So let's start off with sight. So uh, sight is using light in order to detect things that are around us. And robots have a couple of different options for using sight. So the most basic is going to be this light sensor over here. So this just detects if something is bright or if it's dark. Um, next, a robot can actually have a camera, kind of like this drone down here. And that actually just takes images or video. Um, it can use those to figure out what's around it, or it can just send them to another person to actually like see it and see what the robot is seeing. Um, next, we have one that's a little bit unusual compared to how our vision works, um, but it is it is sight-based technically. Um, robots can also use things like a laser rangefinder, which works like this. So it shoots out a laser at something and then uh, counts how long it takes for it to bounce back, and that lets it figure out a distance. So those are a couple of different options that a robot can have in order to see the things around it. Next, we have the sense of touch, and this is going to detect things that are actually contacting the robot. Uh, so first, we have a bump sensor, which looks like this, and this is just a little switch where if something touches it, the switch moves, and it can send a signal to the robot. There's also the possibility of a pressure sensor like this, so it can detect not just if it's being touched, but how hard something is pushing on it. So you can actually use that to measure weight, for example, if you have a robot that um, needs to detect that um, a box is full, it can measure the weight of the box, and once it's full, then it can do whatever it needs to do next. On to hearing. So a robot can also use sound waves to measure the environment around them. Um, the one that's most similar to our senses is a microphone. So this is just reading the senses or reading the sounds that are around the robot. Um, but robots can also have access to things like an ultrasonic sensor, uh, which basically uses echolocation, kind of like a bat. It can send out a signal and use it to get a distance. Now, the last two basic senses here, taste and smell, um, those are both pretty different for people. Uh, but for a robot or for a machine, these kind of come down to the same thing. These are really about figuring out what something is made out of. And robots have access to all kinds of chemical detectors and analyzers, uh, so we're not going to get into the specifics there too much. But you may not have known, but we ha actually have a lot of other senses beyond those basic five. Um, so for example, um, you have an internal sense of balance. Uh, you can try it, 
if you close your eyes and try and just stand upright, if you can do that, that means that you're using your internal sense of balance. And robots can actually do the same thing. Um, so there's a few tools that they can use to measure tilts and angles. Um, a tilt sensor is one that would just tell the robot if it's tilting too far. Um, but a gyroscope could give it the exact angle that it's leaning at. Um, something like an accelerometer can also be used to measure movements. Um, you guys actually all have accelerometers built into your smartphones if you have one. Um, if you can switch your phone from portrait mode to landscape mode just by turning it over, um, it's the accelerometer that lets it know when it's tilted over. Um, another thing that would be important for a robot to measure is its own speed. Um, so just like a car, a robot could have a speedometer, um, or it could just figure it out from lots of other sensors kind of put together. Um, it's important to remember here too, robots are basically machines, so if we can find another tool, we can always add it on to this as well. So it's not limited to just the things that I named here. So let's take a look at movement. So a robot needs to be able to move two things in its environment because um, the robot has some kind of a task and it needs to be able to do that task. So there's two options here. So the first is the whole robot can move around. So it can you know, go across the room, it can go across the street, uh, maybe it can go farther than that. Or the robot can be attached and stay still and just part of the robot can move. So something like a arm that is just reaching around, but the base of it never moves. So we're gonna take a look at a few options here. The first option is wheels. And if you guys remember from the wheel and axle simple machine, um, the point of a wheel is to reduce the amount of energy that we need to move something around. So we've got a few pros and cons here. So the pros are that a wheels usually smooth out movement so something can move pretty continuously. Um, they are capable of very high speeds. Um, and as you can see up here, there's lots of different options for different types of wheels. There's wheels for going fast, wheels for going slow, wheels for driving on Mars like this one over here. Um, some interesting ones like this wheel that can actually go sideways. Um, but the downside is, um, they usually require the surface to be kind of smooth. They're not very good at climbing over things unless the whole robot is kind of built around that. Um, and some versions, like these right here, are actually really easy to damage. They can be really delicate if you drive them in the wrong environment. So that's wheels. Now we're gonna look at a variation of wheels. This would be tracks. So a track, uh, or a, like a tank tread, is a continuous band that's wrapped around a whole set of wheels. So what this does is it basically means that um, it's always driving on kind of a surface that it made for itself. So the benefit of this is that it spreads all the weight out. And if you're driving on something that's soft, like sand or snow, it can actually just ride on top. Uh, and treads are also usually better at driving over things. And since the wheel, since the weight is more spread out, they can usually hold heavier weights. So if you've got a big bulky robot, this is gonna be a good option. The downside is that that whole track is one big complicated piece um, and that tends to make things more complicated and easier to break. Because if any part of that track rips off or breaks, that whole side just doesn't work. Uh, and because of that, they also usually have to move slower and they can't steer as well. Um, they have to kind of do some weird things with those treads in order to be able to turn, uh, so they're a little bit less maneuverable. Uh, the next option is uh, something pretty much straight out of science fiction, and this is a robot with legs. So this would have separate movable legs that all just kind of push on the ground in order to move the robot. You can see an example here. This is one that actually exists in real life. Uh, this is Spot from Boston Dynamics. Um, now, the benefits of a robot with legs are that they can climb over obstacles just by raising their legs a little bit higher. They can be very maneuverable because of that. Um, it's possible to get high speeds as well, but usually not as high speeds as something like the, um, the wheels. Uh, 
Uh, and of course, one possible benefit is that it usually tends to look pretty cool, which depending on the robot could be a big benefit. Now the downside is it's much more difficult to get this working compared to something like wheels. Um, Boston Dynamics has spent the last like 20 years working on this and they do have working robots, but it's been a very long journey. Um, it's also gonna use a lot more power than something like wheels. And it, the robot is gonna have to work really hard to maintain its balance. So it needs to have very good computers on board. But the next option is a flying robot. Um, so the benefit of flying is they have very, very good mobility, very good movement, as long as you're in an open space with lots of height. Um, it's gonna be the fastest option um, compared to any of the others that we've talked about today. And probably the biggest benefit is they can get to heights and angles that other robots can't. You know, a literal bird's eye view of a situation. Um, the downside is it's gonna take a lot of power in order to keep something in the air. And if you're gonna get off the ground, the whole rest of the robot has to be designed to be really lightweight. So you can't have a lot of like heavy machinery with this. Um, one other downside is that if it has wings like these two up here, um, it's going to have to fly pretty fast in order to stay in the air. So if you want a robot that's just going to stay in one place, you can't use that. Now, of course, you can use something more like a drone, like we see right here, um, which you may not have thought about before, but those do fit our criteria of a robot here. Now, those are going to have the advantage of being able to hover, um, but they usually can't move as fast, so there's still a trade-off there. Now, our last movement option is not really a movement option at all. Um, this is actually the fixed in place robot. Like you can see these three industrial robots with their heavy platforms that would be bolted to the floor. Now, the benefit of this is that these are gonna be the most stable. So they're gonna be very good at moving heavy objects, like for example, an entire car at once or they can be very, very precise because they're not going to be very shaky. So there are um, examples of like surgical robots that can basically be like a remote control surgeon operating on a person. Uh, the other advantages are that it's going to be really easy to get power to it, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. Um, and they can be very reliable because you can kind of control exactly what their situation is. Now, the big downside is if you have your robot and it needs to be somewhere else, you have to actually disassemble it and move it yourself. Um, and that also means that anything that the robot is working on, it can't really get to it. So it has to be brought to the robot. That's why you'll see robots like this on things like assembly lines, where all the parts come straight to the robot in the same place. Now, if you guys take a look at the presentation, there's also a variation here, which is where the robot is attached to a rail, kind of like a train. So that kind of splits the difference between an attached robot and maybe a wheeled robot, like we talked about before. It can move, but only in like one particular direction. And it's kind of constrained. So that's like a middle ground there. Now, uh, I'm just going to acknowledge here, there's a few special cases as well. Um, so sometimes robots need to be designed to go underwater. You know, we talked about how robots go to places that are dangerous for people. Under the ocean is one good example of that. And then there's a few also just weirder options. Um, there's some experimental snake-shaped robots for going through like really confined spaces, like going down pipes to check for blockages and stuff like that. Uh, and some of these have the, uh, I just call them flipper tracks. Um, so it's tank tracks that are on these little arms that can change their angle, like you can see here. Um, so it kind of combines the features of tracks and legs as far as getting over obstacles. So moving on to energy. So all robots need some kind of power in order to function. Um, and the source of that power is going to de uh, depend on the robot and its design and where it needs to operate. So let's take a look at a few examples here. So first we have batteries and batteries are chemical cells that store electrical energy. So the benefit of batteries, which I'm sure you're all familiar with, 
is that they're kind of self-contained. It lets the robot operate without being attached to anything else. And modern batteries can actually supply a, quite a lot of power for quite a long time, especially compared to how they were maybe even 10 years ago. Um, and they can also be recharged or replaced when they run out. So you're not kind of you're not stuck to whatever uh, the robot starts out with. Now the downsides uh, we should all pretty much be familiar with. So it's not unlimited power. It will run out eventually. Um, and compared to some other options, it's not as much power either. So if your your robot needs to do something like really intense, like lifting heavy objects or running heavy machinery, um, it's not going to last very long. So moving on, we're going to take a look at uh, the plugged in option. So this is where the robot is directly attached to the to uh, the rest of the power grid, either being like wired directly in, like an attached robot, or with like a tether, like a extension cord. Now the benefit is that it basically can't run out um, unless it, there's like a blackout in the area. And it's usually going to be the most powerful option. So again, if you have that attached robot that's in a factory, it's picking up cars all day, this is what you're going to be doing. Now the big downside is it's not very mobile. So you can't really go anywhere when you're doing this. Um, you're pretty much limited to like the distance of your tether if you have one. Um, or you're just stuck in place. And also, um, it requires you to be in a place that already has a stable electric grid. So this isn't very good for robots that need to go explore, like uh, like NASA's rovers. This would be a very bad choice for them. So from power, we're going to move on to intelligence. So a robot needs to have a computer on board, and it needs to be running a program in order to do anything. Even if it's a teleoperated robot, it still needs to have some kind of programming in order to interpret those commands from the person that's controlling it. In general, the more complicated a task is, the more powerful the computer needs to be. Um, and it can be kind of difficult to break down whether a task is more complicated or simpler. Um, so let's take a look at one kind of silly example here. So in this example, uh, somebody is asking a programmer to make an app that will um, figure out um, when you take a picture if you're inside a national park and whether that picture um, has a bird in it. So it's a little bit silly, but because we have GPS, if you uh, can see the information of where a picture was taken, it's really easy to figure out if it was in a national park. Um, but in analyzing the details of what's in a picture, that's a really hard job. So this is one example where it's kind of hard to tell um, if it's difficult or easy to do this with programming. 